Hi, and thank you for joining me. My name is Erin Owens. I'm a professor in the Newton Gresham Library at Sam Houston State University and the Scholarly Communications Librarian. Today we're going to be unraveling scholarly authorship. Some of our learning goals for this session. You should be able to list common criteria that constitute authorship, explain forms of unacceptable authorship, analyze problems with the order of author names in article bylines, and implement a standard method for crediting all contributors to a scholarly publication. Let's start out by asking, who is an author? Take a look at this byline, yes, byline, from a scientific journal article. This includes 5,154 author names. It's a 33 page article, but only nine pages of that actually constitutes the research being communicated. The other 24 pages are all filled with author names. Take a moment and ask yourself how you feel about this. Do you believe that all 5,000 plus individuals deserve equal credit for just nine pages of published research? What do you think makes someone an author? It will be interesting to investigate your own perspectives on this question. We'll talk a little bit about what some of the standard criteria are that make someone an author. The International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, or ICMJE, has defined a set of standards which have also been adopted by many other journals and organizations in the scholarly research world. They indicate that authors must have made significant contributions to the study ideation and or design. So coming up with the question that the paper is going to analyze, the idea that will be researched, and the actual design of the um, testing or experimentation. Within this, they define some more specific criteria for authorship. An author should have made substantial contributions to the conception or design of the work or the acquisition, analysis, or interpretation of data for the work. And an author should have drafted the work or revised it critically for important intellectual content. So notice this isn't just about editing the paper for grammar or citations, but actually contributing to the writing of the original content or substantive critical revision. And an author should have given final approval of the version of the manuscript to be published. And an author should agree to be accountable for all aspects of the work in terms of ensuring that questions related to accuracy and integrity are appropriately investigated and resolved. So on paper, these four criteria should all be met for an individual to qualify as an author. However, please be aware that items three and four do face some controversy. For example, approval of the final version to be published. If you simply refuse to let someone see and approve the final version, does that mean that you can deliberately omit their name and not credit them as an author? Obviously that would not be ethical. Also, depending on the size and the nature of a collaboration, some authors might feel that they have more expertise and more accountability for specific parts of the paper, but not so much the whole. So all of that goes to say that we should be careful in how we interpret these um, to make sure that we are being constructive and reasonable and not contributing to unconstructive power struggles between researchers. So that gave us some ideas of who is an author. 
there are also some criteria laid out for who is not an author. Someone who did not consent to be listed as an author should not be listed without their permission. Someone who contributed to a paper but really didn't live up to the spirit of those four authorship criteria. Someone who strictly provided oversight of a project, regardless of their professional position. And I hope this last one is obvious, someone who didn't contribute to a project at all. We see some of these criteria being violated in certain types of unacceptable authorship that may crop up or be requested. So let's talk about a few of these types of unacceptable authorship. Guest authorship is crediting someone whose name is well known in a research field just for the advantages that it brings you in terms of getting a paper published, helping that paper to be more visible, or getting that paper cited. If that person did not actually contribute to the project in the ways that constitute authorship, then they should not be listed as a guest author. Gift authorships are a little bit of the opposite, listing someone to do them a favor rather than hoping that their name will do your paper a favor. Maybe this is someone that you went to graduate school with and you know they desperately need a publication to help move along their uh, progress towards tenure. You might think that you're doing them a favor by putting their name on a study, but this is violating ethical principles. A ghost author is when a rightful author is omitted. If someone contributed substantively and met the spirit of those criteria for authorship, they should be included. And finally, anonymous authorship. Publishing under a pseudonym and not taking accountability for your work under your real name or a name with which you are validly associated, even if it is not strictly your legal name. Um, this may happen in very specific, rare cases to protect a scholar from some specifically anticipated risk. But barring those kinds of exceptional cases, a scholar is expected to publish a paper under a name which can be legitimately linked to them so that they can be held accountable for the nature of the work they have published. Authorship for sale is pretty obviously unethical, allowing someone to pay money into a research project or pay money personally to another author to be listed in a byline. It is worth noting that some of these problems arise when there are power differentials. This may manifest as a graduate student and their faculty advisor, but it may also manifest as a lab supervisor and a junior researcher working in that lab. That lab supervisor or that faculty graduate advisor may feel entitled to having their name included in bylines for their junior researcher or their graduate student. But if they did not contribute substantively to the work and meet the authorship criteria, they should not be listed as authors simply because they have a power, a position of power or authority. If a junior researcher or a graduate student feels they are being pressured to provide this kind of inappropriate authorship, they should consult with higher administration in the university for assistance. So now that we have a better understanding of who is and is not an author, how do we actually list names in a byline? Who comes first or second? Who comes last? I want you to think a little bit about your own assumptions when you see these bylines. Here's a byline with two author names. What is your first assumption? Do you assume that these two researchers did equal work? Would your assumption change if the names were in alphabetical order or not? 
Now take a look at this second byline. This article has seven author names in the byline. When it's complicated with seven versus two names, how do your assumptions change or stay the same? Who, if anyone, do you assume was the most significant contributor? Or do you assume they all contributed equally? The reality is when we look at this list of seven names, it's honestly not clear what each of these people did or how much of it they did. Think of citation styles like MLA or APA. How do we cite papers that have many authors? In many cases, what we do is list the first author followed by et al. This is one factor that we need to consider when we think about how we list names in a byline. Even if we agree to put a more principal author first, when we eventually have to decide how to order all the rest, alphabetical order may seem fair on the surface, but we want to remember that those et all citations will constantly disadvantage people later on in the byline. So the recommendation here to get the best results out of your research collaboration is to be sure that you agree on how you will approach the author order when you begin the project, or at least when you begin a paper. Don't leave this until the end. You may face very messy or angry disputes over where each person's name should be. Ultimately, we want to be sure that we're giving everyone credit for the contributions that they've made to a project. We don't want anyone to be excluded from getting credit they deserve, and we also want to make sure that one person doesn't receive more credit than they deserve compared to others. One way that we can do this is by including what's called a credit statement in our articles. Credit is short for the Contributor Roles Taxonomy. This is an official NISO standard for how we can indicate credit in a, in a research project. Using a credit statement helps to support transparency. You give credit to each of the authors. You can also credit non-author contributors. This is an excellent place to acknowledge people who did contribute to a project, but did not rise to the level of the authorship criteria. Credit defines 14 roles which are commonly played by researchers. Here is a list of them, alphabetized from conceptualization of a project, all the way through the writing of the original draft and the review and editing. One person may, of course, play multiple roles. One author may have helped to conceptualize the research, con um, construct the methodology, and write the paper. Additionally, multiple people may play the same role. So two authors may have contributed to the development of the methodology, and four authors may have contributed to writing the paper. So there's a many-to-many -many relationship here. Each person can have many roles and each role could be filled by many people. You also have an option with credit, not required, but optionally, you may indicate lead versus supporting capacities in any of the 14 roles. We'll take a look in a moment at how that works out. With a credit statement, all the contributors to a project and the specific roles they played will be included in a statement in the paper, usually just before the references list. Let's take a look at some examples. This is the byline we saw earlier with two researcher names. This is the credit statement that these researchers included in their publication to be transparent about exactly what contributions they each made. You can see each of the two people's names listed, followed by a listing of the roles from that standardized list. 
you can additionally see two other names here with roles listed. Those were contributors who did not rise to authorship, but who nevertheless deserved to be acknowledged for the contributions they made. Here's a second example of a credit statement where you can see the optional identification of lead roles, supporting roles, or equal roles. We can see that the first researcher listed played an equal role in writing, review, and editing, while the second researcher listed played the lead role in conceptualization. These optional indicators give us even more granular control over indicating how much credit each person deserves for different roles. It is worth noting that individual journals who have adopted credit statements may require specific formatting or structuring of that information as part of their submission process. I've linked the slides to a list of publishers who have officially adopted the credit taxonomy, but it's worth noting that you don't have to be limited to journals that have officially adopted it. Even if you are publishing in a journal which has not officially adopted credit, you may choose to include a credit statement in your paper for that added transparency and acknowledgement. Lastly, let's talk through a few authorship scenarios that may pose some difficulties. In this scenario, I am a junior researcher and I did a lot of the basic work. My supervisor or department head wrote up the work and has not included me as an author. According to our ICMJE authorship criteria, in this case, the junior researcher would not qualify as an author since they did not contribute substantively to the writing of the paper or the design of the study. They were simply carrying out the work as designed by their supervisor. That being said, the supervisor probably should have offered that junior researcher an opportunity to help write up the paper. And regardless of that, they should credit the junior researcher in the paper, perhaps in the form of a credit statement or simply an acknowledgement to recognize the basic work that that junior researcher contributed on their supervisor's behalf. Here's another scenario. My department head insists on being included as an author on any research paper that comes out of his department, but he only obtained the grant money. Is this fair? Or a similar scenario outside of the sciences and more in the humanities that the thesis of the article was based on the researcher's own original ideas and the supervisor simply provided some help and criticism, but they are now demanding that they be listed as a co-author. Clearly the answer to both of these is that this is a request for guest authorship, which should not warrant an inclusion in the byline. There are still some institutions and some departments who think that this is appropriate. If I obtained the grant money, I should be listed as an author. Under best practices, however, that kind of contribution should be acknowledged in another format, such as an acknowledgement statement or a credit statement, but not byline authorship. Let's briefly revisit the learning goals we had for this session. We wanted to be able to list some common criteria that constitute authorship. And now we know those four criteria substantial contributions to the conception or design or the acquisition analysis or interpretation of data, drafting the manuscript or revising it critically, approving the final version to be published, and making an agreement to be held accountable for the work. We discussed some forms of unacceptable authorship, such as guest, gift, ghost, anonymous, and for sale authorship, we analyzed some problems with the order of author names, recognizing that order can create assumptions, but doesn't really make contributions clear, and that relying on alphabetical order can mask some contributions. And finally, we discussed the option of a credit statement 
as something you as an author can choose to include in your paper to transparently describe what kinds of contributions and how much of those contributions each researcher provided to the project. Thank you for watching this short session. I've put my contact information here. If you ever have questions about scholarly authorship, scholarly publishing, or similar topics, please feel free to reach out to me. I am a resource to all members of the SHSU campus in these topics. If you have concerns about a situation that you feel may involve an inappropriate request for authorship, you may also reach out to me confidentially to discuss the situation. Thank you and have a wonderful day.